Amen. Hey, if you've got a Bible, would you please turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 16. I see some people looking at their phones. I'm hoping you are looking at your Bible apps. It's a bit early in the sermon to go to Facebook or anything like that. Give it at least five minutes. Thanks, Scott. I can read that from here. Matthew 28, uh, beginning at verse 16. It says this. Then the 11 disciples, we've lost one. We've lost Judas at this point. When the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, mountains are special places for meeting with God. When they saw him, Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Before I get into this, maybe today someone needs to hear that God is with you. By his Spirit, Jesus is with you. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is truth and it leads us into all truth. It points us to you. Lord, would you open our eyes and our our ears to see and hear you. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to respond to you. And open our, our hands. Lord, that we may do what you ask us to do. Amen. I mean, well, you might remember that we are in a series on the, on the presence of God, the presence of God, becoming more aware of the presence of God. He is everywhere, yet at, some, at times we, we sense him uh, more acutely than at, uh, than at other times, the presence of God. In September, we thought together about prayer, and prayer as a way to become more aware of God's uh, presence with us. Uh, In October, we began to look at hospitality, uh, being together uh, with with other believers, perhaps over a over a dinner table, over a a pub bar, over a a coffee table, uh, wherever you are. Jesus promised that when two or three are are gathered together in my name, there I am, right in the middle. We also thought about uh, communion and that mysterious. Uh, but beautiful truth that when we break bread and wine together, centered on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is with us, that he is with us. And, and last week, uh, Tim and Laura came and shared uh, some stories with us together, which helped us springboard into uh, our, our November theme, which is faith in action. Uh, if the narrative for the last two months has been us becoming more aware of the presence of God. And now we're moving to a place where we're helping others to become more aware of the presence of God. Suddenly our focus is outwards. Our focus is now outwards. Uh, Saint Teresa of Avila, a Spanish saint from the 1500s, said this, Christ has no body. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on the world. Christ has no body on earth but yours. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Do you realize about yourselves that Jesus Christ lives in you? 
Romans 8.10 says that Christ is in you by his spirit. 2 Corinthians 4.6 says uh, that out of darkness a light shall shine. And the one who shined in our hearts is the one who illuminates us with the knowledge of the glory of God. Galatians 1.15 says that God reveals Christ to us from within us. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Ephesians 3.17 speaks about Christ making his home in our hearts. 1 John 4.4 He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. All these beautiful passages speak the beautiful truth that those who have been born again of the Spirit of God, those who have been adopted into the family of God, are the ones who have the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ living in them by the Spirit of God. By God's Spirit, we become more aware of the glorious truth that we were made as image bearers of God. Wasn't that wonderful video that, that um, Tim and Laura showed last week about uh, being made in the image of God? That we, we are those who are made in the image of God to be image bearers of God. Uh, we're supposed to be seen. God is supposed to be seen uh, in us. The children of God, his disciples, as that um, saint reminded us, are, the physical, are now the physical manifestation of God in, in the world. When Jesus was here, and we think about this in December in Advent, and he was the physical manifestation of God in the world. But when he went back to heaven, he left his spirit within us, and now we, his church, are his physical manifestation. We are uh, God, uh, 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 we, are, we are the manifestation of God on earth, when we go from place to place to place into our everyday lives, into those everyday conversations that we have, every social interaction that, that we make, everything that we set our minds to and our hearts to and our, our hands to, everything that we do, we do uh, as if we are doing for God and we're doing with God. We are participating in his Mission. Everything that we do, by the way, uh, we haven't come up with ourselves, but we are joining in with the, with the mission of God in the world. It's not St. Michael's mission that we're on. If it was, we would have probably finished trading a few hundred years ago. That, no, we are engaging with God's mission in Twerton. We carry God's presence within us. Uh, we ever, where, wherever we go. If, if anyone who's ever been in love or, or know anyone that's ever been in love will know how irritating it is when someone first falls in love. Because you know, all they talk about is the person that they've fallen in love with. Have you ever noticed this? Every conversation seems to come back to, oh yeah, but such and such this or such and such that. Every uh, five minutes they're on the phone to this particular person. Their money is spent on this particular person. Their time is, is given over to this particular person. Their affection is given. Their world is centered on the one that they have fallen in love with. They can't help it. The reflex of being in love is that you tell the world. Right? That's what you're meant to do. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that, that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We are his ambassadors, as, as though God were making his appeal through us. As St. Paul says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are his ambassadors, we are his mouthpiece. Do you remember a few years ago, probably quite a few years ago now, um, the Ferrero Rocher advert? It's one of those adverts that's always stuck with me. There's a few, the Ferrero Rocher advert, the Jaffa Cakes, you know, Half Moon, Total Eclipse, you know. I just can't get them out of my head. The Ferrero Rocher advert where there is this lavish party happening in, in a stately ballroom. And everyone is dressed up to the nines in, their, in their, uh, their tails and their collars and their ties and their, and their dinner dresses. Everyone's having a great time. The music's playing. The wine is flowing. There's laughter. There's conversation. Uh, there's dancing. And from across uh, the room, uh, we see these... Uh, 
These, these waiters coming in with, with silver platters in their hands, piled high with mountains of Ferrero Rocher. This is my, this is my dream, people. Make me happy, bring in a platter of Ferrero Rocher. It's getting near Christmas, just saying. <clears throat> and they're handing out these Ferrero Rocher, and, and, um, and a, a, the voice of a lady calls out, Monsieur, with these Rocher already spoiling us. Do you remember that advert, or was it just me? The role of ambassador, of course, extends beyond just throwing fun parties. I'm sure there's quite a few of those that happen. Um, I'm sure that's a massive part of the job. Uh, but actually, the, I had to look up exactly what an ambassador does. And the dictionary uh, helped me by telling me that an ambassador is an accredited diplomat sent by a state as its permanent representative in a foreign country. Makes sense, right? An accredited diplomat sent by the state as its permanent representative in a foreign country country. They, they are accredited. They are given authority. They are released with authority. They are sent into a foreign country. Not the one that they grew up with uh, in or the one that they were born in. They are sent into a foreign place, a resident alien in that place. And not to represent themselves but to represent a state. Something that is much bigger to them. That they belong Two. Friends, this is at the core of who we are. We are ambassadors of Christ, ambassadors of God. The final few words of our passage this morning. Jesus uh, gave the disciples authority, authority that was Christ he gave unto them. He sent them out into the world to represent the kingdom of God. And he promised that they wouldn't go on their own, but that he would go with them by the Spirit. Now it takes them some time as we know from the story uh, but eventually they leave their hub in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea and they spread to the ends of the world. Now here's the thing, we wouldn't be sat here today if they hadn't done their job. If it wasn't for those 11 disciples being obedient we wouldn't be sat here today. Eleven people continued the revolution that Jesus started. He sent them as missionaries to the furthest parts of the world. I wonder today, is God calling anyone to be his missionary in the world? Don't get too settled. Maybe he's calling you to go to another part of the world to be his ambassador, his mouthpiece. Maybe for some he's just calling you to go and knock on your neighbor's door. You see, this mandate that the disciples were given has become our mandate too. We are also sent into the world. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. We belong uh, to the kingdom of God, but we reside, we have our sort of temporary dwelling uh, on this earth. It, it, it takes some uh, getting your head around. Uh, but this thing that we're, we're sat in this world, it's, it's only, it's a temporary thing that, that we're sat in. But we belong to something that is eternal. We have our hearts set on the eternal. And we too have been given the authority of heaven we too have been sent with the spirit of Jesus Christ inside us to, to promote and to do all that we can to ensure that, uh, that the way of God becomes the normative way in the areas that we have influence over. What is the place that you have most influence over? What is the place that you spend most of your time? Right now, that's where you're being sent. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. These, this is Christ's great commissioning of us. We are his disciples. This is what he is asking of us. Uh, this is the equivalent of the pre-match speech. Uh, you know, the, the team will be huddled together uh, and the captain, the manager, will... Uh, we'll be driving into the team. Okay, this is it, guys. 
This is it. The game's about to start. Uh, No pressure, but every pressure. Just go and get them. Go and do what you've been trained to do. We spent hours on the training pitch. We've practiced the routines. But we know how to move together. We know how to, uh, what each other's role is. Now go and do it. This is the go get them chat. For me, this couldn't be clearer. This is the point at which we are being told exactly what is expected of us. Uh, Christ is saying of us, you've been trained, you spent time with me in my presence, you've seen through prayer and through one another, you've seen what you're meant to be doing, I've given you the authority, don't wait around for me to tell you once again that you've been told that you can go and do it, you can go and do it, this is the job, now go and get on with it. His commissioning of us, therefore, must be our primary agenda and our primary Purpose. How many people in this world uh, seem to live without a purpose? I hear it all the time. I'm just not sure what I should be doing with my life. That's not me saying it. That's people saying it to me. I'm not quite sure what I'm meant to be doing. But here is a purpose. Go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's your purpose. That's the job. That's what we're called to do wherever you are, whatever your front line might be. That's wherever you spend most of your time. School gate, looking after grandchildren, after children, at the social club, at the pub, at the football. Whether you're at work, whether you are a parent or a, or a carer, Wherever you are, that is where God is calling you to right now. To fulfill his mission. That's our purpose for our lives. Uh, I like to think of it kind of like a spy, although it slightly breaks down because a spy is supposed to be somewhere pretending to be something in order to obtain information. Uh, We're kind of somewhere being something but giving information. So stick with me. It's a bit tenuous. We might be working in an office on a spreadsheet or on, in a shop on a till. But actually, our real job, the, the real reason for our being, the real reason for our existence, the real thing that we should be doing is making disciples. This is Christ's commission of us and this is now our mission. This is what it means to put our faith into action. We can come along every week and we can have a jolly good time together, a praise up. We have okay coffee, occasionally have cakes. It can be fun. But if if this is it, I'm out. If this is all we're about, week in, week out, I'm leaving. (laughs) We've got to be more, it's got to be more than this. It's got to be more than this. Uh, The Church of England explores the subject of mission and faith in action using five marks. And I think they're quite good as they combine both a proclamation, the speaking out, and demonstration, doing something. Uh, They also promote the notion that our faith must be enacted through all creation. Here they are. Uh, the, the first mark of mission uh, is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. The second is to teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. The third is to respond to human need by loving service. The fourth is to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation. And the fifth is to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and to sus- sustain and to renew the life of the earth. Uh, The idea, by the way, is that we don't just cherry pick one and three and leave the rest. It's that we we have a faith that embodies all of these things. It's not simply about what we're passionate about or good at. It's a faith that's characterized, kind of summed up by doing all these things. Firstly, to proclaim the good news wherever you are, on the bus, at home, in the coffee shop, at work, proclaim the good news. Good, good news, 
Not just news, good news. It's good. It's good news. Good is good in my mind. Good is not bad. Good is happy. Good is joyful news. Joyful and life transformational. Good news is optimistic. Hope is an optimistic thing, not a pessimistic thing. Uh, we can't really proclaim good news and, and hope uh, kind of just with melancholy <laughs> or dour faces. I think it sort of rather compromises the integrity of the goodness of the news. Friends, we have a good story to tell. Uh, we have fallen in love and we want the world to know it. There's nothing bad about that. Secondly, to teach baptize and nurture new believers. This is the job of all people, not just the vicar or the rector. All of us, this is what we're meant to be doing. A teaching, who's involved in teaching and education in this place or has been? Okay, a few, few educators in the room. It's hard work, isn't it? Uh, it, it, it requires patience. Uh, interestingly, People don't get things straight away or in the way that you want them to get them or as quickly as you want them to get it. It's true with new believers. It's true with all believers. You know, someone's become a Christian, baptized them into the Christian faith and you just want to smack their heads together when they go and do the thing that you think that's not what you should be doing. It takes time to learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. You don't need all the, it's not a prerequisite to baptism. The learning comes after and after and after and after that. We're all, we're all learning this thing together. Let's have patience with one another in our attempt to teach and become co-learners. I'm so grateful to those in my life who have the patience to help me to learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And, you know, I, 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 they probably want to smack my head, you know, time and time again with the mistakes I made. Uh, to become a disciple of Jesus is a lifelong journey. And we need, we need people around us to teach us. And we, we need to teach one another, help one another. Okay, thirdly, third mark of mission, uh, to respond to human need by loving service. Just again, I loved your, your talk last week, Tim and Laura. Thank you so much for that. And Richard and Kirsty, thank you so much for making that available uh, online. It meant that while I was away this, this week, I could still catch up. And uh, so I'm very grateful to you guys for, for those things. They're, they're exemplifying this stuff. Faith in action. Faith with hands. Faith with legs. Faith that has a voice. You know, this is classic good, good Samaritan stuff, isn't it? To respond to human need by loving service. I heard a story just yesterday about a social experiment that was done in, in the United States, in a college in the, in the United States. And um, it's made worse by the fact that it was a theological college. Um, but they were, they were kind of um, testing 20 people to see what their reaction would be. And uh, they, one by one, they asked them to walk the length of a path to an auditorium. And they were told before they, before they took their walk uh, that at the end of the path, in about five minutes, you're going you're, you're gonna to go and talk for five minutes to a crowd of, of people. So on the way, you might like to think about what you're going to say. So off the first one goes, and, and halfway down the path, uh, they encounter someone in, in real need, in utter need, crying out for help. You know, I don't know what to do, help me. And um, the study showed that, that something like um, only 6 or 7% of them stopped to help the person and didn't go on to give their talk. The passage that they've been given was the Good Samaritan. <laughs> that was what they were supposed to be 
talking about at the end of the path, yet they couldn't help the person on, on the way. It's so easy to become too busy or too caught up or too consumed, even with the good stuff of doing church, to actually respond to the needs of society around us with love and care. You see, it costs us something. It costs us to respond to the needs of others. It's expensive. Friends, this is what Jesus did for us on the cross. He responded to our deepest human need to be loved, forgiven, set free, redeemed, restored, and everything else that the cross accomplished. He responded to our deepest human need for love's sake. For our sake, he became poor. For our sake, he became sin so that we might be free from sin. He responded to our deepest human need with loving service. Fourthly, uh, to transform unjust structures of society, to uh, challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation. Again, we see this exemplified in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, our role model. This is exactly what Jesus did and does. Uh, We can stick plasters on people for so long. Uh, We can welcome them into the food bank time and time and time again. Uh, We can fix them up and send them on their way. Uh, We can give them the few quid that they need for that minute. That's fine. That's all good. That's responding to human need. Yet this point is stirring us to explore what lies behind the person's need, what the root problem or what the root need is. We're being invited not only into advocacy but activism. This is where social action meets social need. This is where uh, we not only provide the food but we ask the question why are they going hungry in the first place? Okay, fifthly, Let's move through them a bit quicker now. To strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. This is the first job that we were given. uh, And it wasn't written out of the Bible. It's still there. Uh, We're we're still meant to be uh, working with God to look after creation, to steward the earth. That is putting faith into action. God is the master landscape designer and we are his gardeners. That's why we go around picking up litter. or uh, that's, that's why we make sure we're recycling. That's why we switch our energy providers to, to renewable sources. That's why we use uh, coffee cups, uh, which can be used time and time and time again, not because it's the latest fad. or It's because God called creation good. Because creation matters to God. And because it matters to God, it should matter to us. And because it was good to God, it should be good to us. This is putting our faith into action. Friends, we've become a people who are enlightened to the presence of God. We've learned that through prayer. We've learned that through hospitality. We've become a people who have become more aware of the presence of God in our time together, in worship, uh, over, the, over the table, in our social interactions. And I think it's now time for us to rededicate or renew ourselves uh, to that commitment to ensuring that those around us come into contact with the presence of God. It's okay to rededicate yourselves multiple times to this thing, to remind yourselves again and again and again, this is what I'm all about. This is, this is our purpose. This is our reason for being. This is putting our faith into action. So two questions to finish. What's your front line? What is the place that you spend most of your time? What is the place that you're going to seek to put your faith into action? And secondly, how will you put your faith into action? You're going to put your money where your mouth is. How will you blend proclamation and demonstration? How are you going to, how are you going to do it? Let's just close our eyes for a minute as we think about those two things. 
where are we going to be God's people and, and how are we going to show his presence to other people? And here's another question to think about. How will this time next week look different to today? What will you do over the next week in response to what God may be calling you to do this week? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your your word, the richness of your word. We thank you, Lord, for your church through the ages and the wisdom that we uh, can learn from, from those who go before us. Thank you for the wisdom of those who go with us. Father God, as those who carry your presence within us, Lord, may we, may we go out into the world that we inhabit to be your hands and your feet, to be your, your mouthpiece in this world. Lord, have our lives, take our lives, Take all that we are and use them for your glory so that many, many people may come into contact with your presence. That many, many people may see their lives transformed by your transformational presence. Lord, help us, we pray by your spirit. Amen.